and welcome. Um, here we all are again, or as Jimmy Cricket used to say, and there's more. Um, <laughs> so we're here for the second time. It's great to, to see you all this evening. And um, if you're here for the first time or a visitor, we give you a special welcome. Great to see you and thanks for coming along. And we hope that you enjoy your time with us here tonight. Um, I want to read Psalm 103. And I'm not going to say much about it before I move into prayer. I think it says, says enough. And it's just entitled, Of David. So David wrote this. And it's a lovely psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant, who remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Let's talk to God in prayer. Lord, we do come this evening to bless you and to thank you for all your many benefits towards us. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you of this place where we can come uh, and be together. We thank you that we are part of the people of God. We thank you that we're within that circle of care of, of the fellowship of the people of God. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for the people over the years who have been faithful to this place where your name has been honored and your word has been preached and people have been strengthened in faith. And Father, we thank you that you are a God who is faithful. You are a God on whom we can depend. You're a God who never lets his people go. You have said, never will I leave you or forsake you. And Father, we rest in that tonight. We thank you that there is a Sabbath rest for the people of God, that we can rest in you day by day as we go about our business, as we love you, Lord, and as we love our fellow human beings. We thank you that there is a rest for our souls. And we thank you that we can have a peace within our hearts, the peace that passes all understanding as we present our requests to you day by day with thanksgiving. Father, tonight we want to lift folks before you who are maybe not too well at the moment. We think of Julie, Lord. We ask, O oh God, that your healing touch will be upon her even now, that your spirit would fill her spirit and soul and body with the healing power of Jesus. We thank you, O oh Jesus, that you are our Redeemer and our healer, and our saviour, and our Lord. We pray for Richie Spencer, Lord, as he goes down to his appointment tomorrow. We're praying, O oh God, for healing for Richie. We pray that you be with him and fill him with your peace and the healing power of Jesus. We pray that that would come upon him even now. We pray that for Ian as well, Ian Campbell. We're asking, O oh God, that you would touch him with your healing presence. We thank you that Jesus is the same yesterday and today 
and forever. And we're asking, O oh God, that in these days you would manifest your presence and your power as we faithfully live out your gospel in this fellowship. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for all your benefits towards us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the restored relationship that we have with you through Jesus Christ our Lord and to him and to you, God our Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, may all praise and glory be to you. Amen. Thank you, Willem. Let's just take time to sing two or three songs together as we rise and as we worship him this evening. All the abundant blessings that are bestowed upon us, as Willem just said there, yet we're restored and we're redeemed and it's free. I'll never get used to that. I don't think I'll ever understand it, that freely he gave it all for us, surrendered his life upon that cross, but great is that love. It's poured out for all. This is our God. Let's stand as we sing this lovely hymn together, freely you gave. Now, we're a little bit short up here tonight, so you'll need to be big in voices. That's a, we've got the girls here, thankfully, but if I get, some, get things wrong tonight, just keep going. Just, just roll straight over the top of me in case my fingers stop working. But let's stand as we sing.
on the decks again tonight here with her little iPad which helps out just a little bit. This is my daughter's favourite favourite hymn of all time I think so she'll be quite happy she's here tonight and we're going to sing it. Jesus paid it all. I hear the Saviour say thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness watch and pray and find in thee my all. It's an old hymn but it's had a slightly kind of fresher feel to it but let's just join together as we sing. if you like, from an old hymn that's been modernized over the years as we sing 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We read these words earlier. O my soul, worship his holy name.
to be together again this evening. Uh, we're coming to continue in our series in 1 Samuel. If you have your either blue Bible maybe under your seat or in front of you, you'll find it at page 226. 1 Samuel, and we'll be looking at chapter 2. This evening we're intending to finish off chapter 2 in our series in 1 Samuel. It's rather ambitious, but I have faith in us. The um, whole section really is about the wicked sons, and I wanted to kind of keep it together. And if you don't thank me tonight, at least you'll thank me when we look at chapter 3 uh, next week. But uh, we should get through it pretty quickly, although it's a bit of reading to do. So we begin at verse 11 together. So, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand and he'd thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. 
For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who are serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. They said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it's not a good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of the Father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to up to my altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by faring yourselves in the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise you lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house. So there'll be not an old man in your house Men in distress shall look with envious eyes and all the prosperity that should be bestowed on Israel. And there shall be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my house and in my field, in my mind. And I'll build him a shoe house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or loaf of bread and shall say, please put me in one of your priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Amen. God's word to us this evening. Let's just pray together as we come to his word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way that you are working your sovereign plan here in 1 Samuel before us to bring about a king and to bring about much more than a king. Lord, as we come to your word, may we be open enough to receive it where it applies into our own lives, be able to see you in greater ways, particularly your faithfulness, and to see the communion table in a deeper way as we see what the true priest really looks like. In your precious name we ask and pray. Amen. So the whole section, as you can imagine, is pretty bad news. There's a glimmer of hope peeking through. Samuel is beginning to grow in stature and favor with the Lord. He's being prepared, but for what? In contrast, we have this question, what's God going to do about Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas? What we're beginning to see is that in God's sovereign plan, he's weaving these two stories together. We're told in verse 12, the sons of Eli's were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. What makes this all the more tragic as a story, as a historical account of what's happening before there was a king, is that Eli's sons were priests. They were the men who were were meant to represent God to the people and represent the people towards God. And we find that they were ignorant of God. In fact, they're described as being worthless. They were in the worst possible 
position for men of their disqualification. They were corrupt. They didn't care about doing their job well. They had no fear of the Lord because they didn't know him at all. The two together meant that they did, like Israel, whatever was right in their own eyes. For these sons, that meant ruining the sacrifices of people. Imagine if you were one of the maybe few by this point, like Elkanah, who continued to worship God devoutly, going up regularly to sacrifice and worship God. And when you got there, you knew how the sacrifice was to be done because God had been really clear. It was a very serious affair. There's a lot of times in the Old Testament of the way you need to approach God, even um, there, there's a, an account, I forget exactly where it is, but of the Ark of the Covenant being carried, and when it begins to drop, one of the priests carrying it puts his hand out to touch it and is killed because of the glory of the Lord present in the Ark of the Covenant. This was something to do fearfully, something to recognize that, that coming with the presence of God was the glory of God, was a power that we were completely unable to approach without first being made right. But that was not what we find with Eli's sons at all. How you're meant to approach God is on his terms in order to seek his forgiveness until the time came for God to put things right through his son, Jesus Christ, once and for all. And even here, where the focus is to access to God's goodness, Notice how God even provided for those who mediated on God's behalf. They would receive payment through the sacrifice as well. God's generosity even comes to display in moments of repentance. We see it most clearly in Leviticus 7. It says, the priest shall burn the fat of the altar. Remember, burn the fat of the altar, that's important. But the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons, and the right thigh shall give to the priests as a contribution from the sacrifice of the priest's offering. Here it was that even in times when people were bringing sacrifices before God, God provided for those people who took the role of mediating between God and men. Such was his generosity. But the priests under Eli's authority, the sons under Eli's, the servants who served Eli's sons, had invented this new system, like bobbing for apples, it's kind of like. Verse 13 says that the custom of the priests was that, the people, was that when a man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants would come, with when the meat well was boiling, and with a three-pronged fork in his hand, he'd thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Now, as I read that, I could imagine the priests declaring something like, you know, the three-pronged fork plunges at random, and whatever comes up is what God wants us to have. It's not us doing it, it's totally chance, it's just up to the sovereignty of God, and so as we just stick this fork in, whatever comes up, it's, it's not us taking it, it's God giving it to us. But this is not what was to be given to them, this is what was due to the Lord in place of our sins. It was being stolen from God by the very people who were meant to be ensuring that these sacrifices were done properly. They already had profit for their role, but they wanted more even at the expense of what God was doing and providing for them. Remember, Leviticus 7 says that all the fat should be burned at the altar, as we were reading. But instead, the servants would say in verse 15, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only the law. He wants the fat that's to be burned to God. He doesn't just want the meat, he wants the flavor of the fat burning alongside it. He's got taste. He's got his preference. He probably has a particular cut that he wants to take as well. What he's been offered isn't enough. And if someone was devout and knew well, find what Leviticus 7 says. And they would say, listen, you can have it. If you really want to break it, just let me do the first part. Let me just burn all the fat first to give it to the Lord. Well, they'll come along in verse verse 16 says, no, give it to me now. And if not, I'll take it by force. Either you give it to me willingly or I'll take it. But either way, it's coming with me. We're told the corruption goes further. Verse 22, they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Tent of meeting was the temple, God's dwelling place before the building was, uh, before a building was built by King Solomon. Here is where God is approachable, especially to seek forgiveness with these sacrifices for the sin that separate God and the people. These men would then use their position of power to sleep with women whose job it was to serve God at the entrance of the tent 
of meeting. God's dwelling was being turned into a brothel. Instead of it being a place where people could come to confess sin, it was a place where you could go to conduct sin. Imagine the pain and agony of the place where God dwells being used in such a way to dishonor God. It's here that we finally see some action taken by uh, Eli in what clearly has been a whole case of inaction for some time. Eli, the father through whom these sons have inherited their role. Eli, who is the one who is the religious priest and the judge, chief voice for God to the people of Israel, comes along and says in verse 23, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, he says, my sons, it's not good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? This man is the only Hebrew authority to remove his sons. And he points out what's good for them, what's not good to them. He even sees what they're doing. And it's being reported to him, not only by those who are faithfully going up to the sacrifice, but he's hearing that it's getting spread abroad. The reputation of Israel is becoming at risk here. He's maybe heard from the women as well who are at the tent of meeting. But all we see in verse 25 is that they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. They would not listen. They were too far gone, with no respect for their father, no fear of God because they didn't know him. We get the same sense in Pharaoh and Exodus. In some places it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. In other places it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I remember in first year at university having to write a paper on who was right. <laughs> of course, the answer is they're both right. The answer is that uh, neither one is untrue. God is working his sovereignty, but that doesn't take away from our responsibility. The sons rejected God, and in rejecting God, they rejected any chance to repent. And rejecting any chance to repent, they would face the wrath of God. That's why sin is so much more dangerous than we often explain it to be. We sometimes treat sin like a light thing, but it's not, it's destructive. It's something that gets between us and God, particularly repetitive sin. It's so unhealthy in our lives because it, it numbs us to God. It numbs us to a chance to repent to God. It numbs us from a sense of who God is. 1 John 1, if you remember, we went through a series in, in 1 John in the evening. He says in the first chapter, this is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you. This is the Apostle John speaking. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And of course, it's important to then see just a few verses later, the beginning of 1 John 2, John says, in a fatherly way, my little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with God, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. There it is. You know, if, if we sin so much and we're okay with it and we hold on to it and we are proud of it and we keep it, and there's something wrong with us. In fact, there's something wrong with our relationship with God. God, John's even calling us a liar. But if we've got things in our life that we're doing and we're taking it to God and saying, Lord, I know this is something I'm struggling with and I'm so sorry for it, then this is a sign that this is not the kind of answer where we would say, you are so wicked, you are cast out because it's in God's throne. It's through Jesus Christ, the righteous. that He's our advocate that we lay them at the cross and find forgiveness. But for those sins that we're okay with and we're proud of and we're happy with, these are the ones that are most dangerous. These are the ones that ate away at these two sons to the point where there was a point of no return for them. So the sons have been in the temple. They've been the witness of the sacrifices every day. They would have understood the symbolism of everything they were doing. The prayers for forgiveness, the sacrifices that were representing taking on our sins the burning of the sacrifices as a fragrant offering to God. And I'm sure there's a bit of symbolism maybe as well as the, the portions and the meat fat burn down to ash 
may be a sign that our sins were being taken away and left to nothing. Even their inheritance as priests, and the breast and the thigh should have been a reminder of who they owed their gratitude to. Then they had a second chance. The one who gave them their inheritance from birth, their father, Eli, speaks to them about how dangerous it is to do evil against God because it's God who mediates and still they don't listen. And the third and final warning comes from a man of God. We know nothing about him except he, what matters, I suppose, which is that he's a man of God. And God's message explains, did I not give your father everything you have, Eli? Was it not I that chose Aaron and the Levites as priests? Didn't I provide for you? And he goes on in verse 29, why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling? And honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on choicest parts of my offerings of the people of Israel. Look at Hannah, Eli, who you have blessed in verse 20 because of her petition. Here you blessed Hannah because she gave the first child of her womb in service to the Lord. But then you have profited by taking these choice parts in every offering. And the way it's language is as if he's profited also. Don't you see, Eli, how Hannah and Elkanah have found righteousness, but you've corrupted yourself? Can't you see that you had warning after warning and yet you've done nothing? That I've shown you my power and even answering the prayer by Hannah, but you've still not honored me. You've always chosen to honor your sons. Verse 30. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I'll cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that we not be an old man in your house. Now, it takes place in a number of ways. First of all, Samuel replaces them when replacing Eli. We didn't have time to really appreciate, but we can, we can read it, and you can see it kept jumping from the wicked sons to Samuel ministering before the Lord in verse 18. Samuel continued to grow in stature and favor with the Lord, verse 26. Samuel's purposely put in contrast to the sons. He's more like the last judge, uh, like Eli's a judge, than an actual priest. But he does offer sacrifices, which we'll see later when King Saul ends up doing a sacrifice himself without waiting for Samuel to come and do it at great cost to King Saul. But also later on, a guy called Zadok becomes priest in 1 Kings 2. And he replaces the last of Eli's descendants, removing Abathar. Regardless, the fulfillment comes in an even greater way in Christ. So let me just say one thing, kind of coming towards our finish. We're doing pretty good for time, I would say, as well. The great tragedy of the wicked sons and what led to the destruction was that they made a great mistake that all of us can make. They wanted what they could get from God, but they didn't want God himself. This, I think, there's, there's many lessons you can take from these sons, but I think this is the biggest one. You might want God's security and his health and his protection. And we come across to him, and really, when we come with these things as our agenda, we're coming to see what we can get from God, what we can gain from him, the benefits of being around God. We'll often, if we are in this case, find ourselves in difficult times angry with God. We begin to feel like he's abandoned us. You know, God, if you really love me, why would you let anything bad happen to me? And it might not be the same as taking from that offering plate and the sacrifice, but it's a sign that we want a portion from God. And not necessarily the portion we've been given, but an additional portion from him. And we we're about to see how great God's portions really are in Jesus Christ. But if he isn't enough for you, then we need to repent of that attitude towards God. It certainly isn't that we, can ask, we can't ask for change. If the, the wonderful thing about 1 Samuel is that Hannah did, and God heard her prayer and gave her what she wanted. God intervened in her life, in that great sorrow and pain that she carried with her. So it's not that we can't come to God and say, Lord, this situation is too hard for me. Can you change it? Can you do something about it? Can you help me with it? 
But Hannah found peace before she was pregnant, remember, because she found peace in who God was, not what she could get from God. We shouldn't confuse God's love for us with our current situations that we're in. We shouldn't see access to God as a way to access what we want. But instead, we should recognize that access to God gives us access to God. We don't come with ulterior motive. We don't come with our own agenda. We just come before God. The great thing is, as we come towards the communion table, as we discover exactly what God gives to us, he doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what we need. So often in our life, we're like, if we could just, if this could just change, my life would be so much better. And so often God will answer that prayer. And what we find is, actually, there's something else now that's taken our focus. When we come to God and understand what God has done, as we come towards the communion table, as we come to see in just a second, we see that God offers us something greater than just working in our own circumstances. Although he does work in our own circumstances as he worked in Hannah's circumstances. But praise God, he is not someone who needs our approval. Praise the Lord that he's not running around just giving us what we want in the hope that we might like him. But he's come with his son that we might be able to love him. And that's much greater. So as we lead to communion, let's finish ourselves looking at verse 35. It says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I'll build a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. This promise from God, spoken by the man of God to Eli, is a greater promise than just a replacement of Eli. Notice how in verse 30, God reminds Eli how he promised his father's house that it would go on forever before me. But now in verse 35, he promises a faithful priest, not a lineage. You see, to Aaron and Levi and the Levites, there was a promise that your family will become the priest. But now we find one faithful priest. And it's here that we begin looking for one man. And we're told that this priest will go in and out before my anointed forever. This was not Samuel. This was not Zadok. This is only Jesus Christ, the faithful priest. And he's a priest unlike any other. Where the wicked sons displease God by doing what was right in their own eyes, here in great contrast, Verse 35 tells us that this faithful priest shall do according to what is the Father's will. He shall do according to what is in the God the Father's heart and mind. When the wicked sons gained from the sacrifice in the table, in the temple, taking not only what was their payment but also more, Jesus, in fact, becomes the sacrifice. Not only does he not take out more, he puts himself in as the ultimate sacrifice in place. Although he's raised by the Father in glory at the temple where the sacrifice takes place, Jesus becomes the sacrifice, giving more than just an offering, but offering himself for our sake. And where the wicked priests used the temple as a way to gain pleasure with the woman at the entrance, Jesus became the temple and took the pain of sin and the suffering, and the mocking, and the torture, in order that we might gain the pleasure of salvation for ourselves. Finally, where the wicked priests, Hophni and Phinehas, ended up rejected forever because of the rejection of God, Jesus Christ takes the rejection that we were due, being separated in that moment when he had sin on his shoulders as he died on the cross taking the weight of our sin through faith, though he knew no sin himself. He experienced that rejection of God the Father on the cross so that we would never experience that rejection. And so instead, where uh, Hophni and Phinehas find an eternal rejection, we find an eternal acceptance in the house of the Lord forever with a promise that cannot be broken as Eli's was. 
that is secure in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we're told at the end of that verse 35 that he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. Jesus, the great mediator between God and man, is the mediator forever. There'll never be an upgrade. You'll never lose them. There's never a sense here where Jesus stops being the mediator. From now and for eternity, he continues to be the one who brings us into the house of God, brings us into the presence of God. And it's through him because we are clothed in his righteousness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his perfect obedience to God the Father and the law. Everything that he has achieved will forever be our sign and our security that we are indeed children of God. And where the rejection is forever for Hophni and Phinehas, our acceptance is forever and secure in him. As we come to the bread and the wine, we come to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done. Jesus has given himself, not taken from the temple, but given himself in the temple. Jesus has come not to gain from the temple his own pleasure, but to suffer for our sake by laying down his life. He's come not to corrupt the sacrifices by doing them improperly, but he's come to perfect the sacrifices by being the sacrifice and fulfilling it perfectly for us. And he's come that we might know once and forever that he is our mediator. He is the true, faithful, faithful priest. He's the one that was promised right back in that moment as the rejection of Eli was taking place. Not only was God saying, I'm going to work out my plan right now by sending Samuel. And Samuel's the one that's going to bring a king so that people will not continue to just do what is right in their own eyes. But in that same moment, this man of God comes to Eli and he lays a promise that can only be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And it's a promise that is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your grace and your mercy and your love. We think of the reality that even these uh, thousands of years ago, when it would be so easy just to deal with the problem at hand, we are amazed at the fact that you, even then, we're promising and planning and bringing to fruition your plan of salvation for the world. We're so grateful, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ, that his love drove him with nothing in us to attract him, nothing in us to be worthy of being saved, but just his love for us that caused him to come into the world to experience the weight of sin on his shoulders for our sake, to be mocked and tortured and rejected for our sake, to become the sacrifice, even though he was the priest, for our sake. That we might know once and forever that our faithful priest is faithful to us and is faithful to you now and forever. Always bring us before you in the righteousness that he achieved, in the goodness that he has, in the fulfillment of all things. That we might be accepted fully, not partly, not a little, but fully as your children. For these things we give you thanks, Lord. May we always be deepened in our love of you as we discover more and more how much you love us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. We've come to that point in our service that we're going to break bread and we're going to take wine in a second or two. And we do that in obedience, okay. as we were commanded to do, to remember, remember him. I'm going to sing this lovely hymn and chorus together. It's really quite a challenge for us. This is my desire. To honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, as we will do in a second or two. But it goes on to say, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. 
and I live for you alone. Every breath I take, every moment I am awake, Lord, have your way in me. What a challenge that is as we sing it tonight. It's easy to just come on a Sunday and to stamp the card of a turning up to church, but it's a different thing to sing, Lord, it's my desire to give you my heart, to give you my soul, and to live for you alone. But I encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing together. This is my desire. <clears throat> set before us, let's just remind ourselves <clears throat> of where our strength and our hope comes from tonight. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace in every, star, every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone. I 
to a time of communion together. We have an open table, which means all those who know and love the Lord are welcome to take part in this table. But if you're not really sure, if you're exploring faith, then there's no embarrassment about letting the bread and the wine pass you by at this time. It's a question that comes up from from Eli to his sons when he's rebuking them. He says, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? The question is left open, but we know what the answer is. Jesus Christ. All sin is really rebellion against God. Therefore, all sin is sin against God. And that question that Samuel, uh, Eli, pardon me, asked, who can mediate between God and man when God has been offended? Well, only God can mediate. And so God came. God the Son took on flesh, came into the world in order to represent each one of us, in order to fulfill what it means to be human, in living the only man who ever lived in perfect relationship with the Father, who then came to be the faithful priest, knowing that this faithful priest wasn't just doing everything perfectly at the temple, would actually mean laying down his own life. Laying down his body, laying down and giving and shedding his blood on the cross for our sake. That question, who can mediate, resounded like an echo until it was finally answered. When Jesus says, I can. Come to me, he says. I'll give you rest. Come to me, I'll give you forgiveness. Come to me as the only one who can give you forgiveness. But I've come that you might have it. We come knowing, as we come to this table, that we have a faithful priest. He who has made us right before God. 
And so we come with empty pockets, nothing to bring ourselves. There's nothing that we can do that achieves this. This is purely a gift from God. It's a gift that is shown in the evidence of his son who left the comfort of heaven to come all the way down just to be rejected by his own creation. That though he knew no sin to take on sin, he'd done no wrong and yet took on our wrong. The one who was in perfect fellowship with the Father had the brokenness of some kind of having sin on his shoulder. If Jesus gave all of this, we can be assured that Jesus is committed. And so we can know he's the faithful priest who will be our mediator forever and ever. Not a day will go by when he regrets it. Not a day will go by when he tries to take it back. Not a day will go back when he undoes it. He is proud of his achievement in giving glory to the Father by giving forgiveness to all those who know him as Lord and Saviour. Might be like these wicked sons that there are things in our lives that have just become so numb to us. They've become almost acceptable. And 1 John tells us if we continue in these sins, we make God out to be a liar. But my little children, says John, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I encourage you to come and know Christ's gift of righteousness, but I also encourage you, if there are things that come to mind, to make today the first day when we say, Lord, we've become far too used to these sins and we lay them before you because we want to live in lives that glorify your name. We want to lay these things before you and recognize that we don't want to make you out to be a liar or be made out to be liars. And we can have the assurance that John gives to us straight after that hard-hitting text that we indeed do have an advocate. Let's have the prayer for the bread and the wine. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that there is a mediator between us and you. And Father, that chasm was so great that we could never have made our way across. No matter how loud we would have shouted or no matter how great or good we thought we were, we thank you that Jesus dying on the cross means that we are now accepted in the beloved and for that we give you thanks. Father, we thank you for this bread which represents to us the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that when he died, we died in him, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we thank you for this wine which represents unto us the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for us to wash our sins away. Father, we come before you now in this quiet moment and just confess our sins before you and bring any sicknesses or illnesses that we have before you. In Jesus' name, we bring them. Father, we thank you that you are the God who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases and brings us back to you, to that place of life and health and peace. Amen. Paul, speaking to the church in Corinth, says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll take the bread as we receive it.
The same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We'll take the wine together as a sign of our unity in Christ. Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's close our service together in prayer. Our Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to proclaim all that you have done for us. It is proclaimed into our own hearts, into one another as we fellowship, but also as a public sign into the world. Lord, we pray as we go from here, we would go from here as a light shining into the darkness. We pray we would go with confidence that you are indeed our faithful priest, our great advocate. And Lord, we would go from here with a great desire to lay everything down for your sake knowing that we miss out in nothing but gain everything. As you laid down everything you had in order that we might gain Jesus Christ, the righteousness. You have given us more than we could ever ask or imagine and blessed us beyond anything we could amazingly achieve or ask or even comprehend, Lord. Even the comprehension of your goodness is impossible without faith given to us as a gift. But Lord, we thank you now that we go with a sense that 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, there's no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun. Indeed, you have done a glorious thing in our lives. Lord, we give you thanks and praise, and we thank you for this opportunity to be reminded of it. May we always have confidence in who you are, in what you've done, and who you've made us to be. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.